Let's start with prayer. That's a good way to start, I think. Heavenly Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you for your word once again, Lord. Thank you that we have the ability to come and, and study your word and dive into it, Lord. We know that your word changes us. We know that it's living. We know that it's active, Lord. And so we just pray right now that your Holy Spirit would pour out upon this place and that you would move us, Lord, in a mighty way through your word, through the teaching of your word and through the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, baptize each one of us with your presence. We need it, Lord, in these days. We need it in every day, Lord. Just help us to be faithful witnesses. Help us to be those who uh, serve you with our whole hearts, Lord. And help us tonight as we, we go through these verses, Lord, to see your truth and to see your hope. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. We're going to be Revelation chapter 7 tonight. And Lord willing, we're going to make it all the way through the chapter. And don't get too scared. It's, you know, it's a whole chapter. But this is what I love about chapter 7. It's, it's kind of an interruption of sorts. It's, uh, you know, scholars call it a parenthetical chapter. You know, it just means it's a big word. It means just a pause. You know that. It's just a pause in the action. And I think... Um, it's, it's, uh, it's well needed, too, because when you think about all of these judgments we're going through, you know, we've just seen some pretty brutal stuff. And so it's kind of nice to see this chapter that it's almost like, you know, God's mercy that he shows throughout history. He does the same thing with his book of Revelation. We go through these, these brutal, you know, these six seals, and then he says, hey, here's a pause, and I'm going to tell you some hopeful things. And I think I like that about this chapter. In any case, um, I've talked about the judgments. We're in the middle, or we're, we're, we've just finished the sixth seal. And then we have this pause until chapter 8 when we'll see the seventh seal. But I also told you that in these three sets of judgments, the, the seals, the trumpets, and the bowls, it's not necessarily sequential. It's not necessarily 100% perfectly linear. We see some things that overlap and that we don't know exactly how they fit. We kind of have an inkling how they might fit, but it, these things are all future events. So we don't know how these three sets of judgments are going to work out. But we do see this pause, this parenthetical, after each one of the sixth seals or sixth trumpet or sixth bowl judgment. We'll see actually almost two entire chapters after the sixth trumpet. And we'll see only one sentence. It's still a pause, but it's just one sentence after the bowl, after the sixth bowl judgment. But that one sentence is a big sentence. I'm not going to go into it tonight, but it's the Lord speaking, and it's pretty incredible. In any case, tonight we're going to be answering the question that the wicked people of the earth asked last week. You know, when we're looking at chapter 6, we saw these stars falling from heaven, the sky rolling up like a scroll, the sun turning dark, the moon turning blood red. We saw this great earthquake that moved every mountain out of place, every island out of place. The earth staggered like a drunk man. And, and all these people hid themselves in the rocks and in the caves. And this is what they said. In Revelation chapter 6, verse 15 through 17, it says, And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? And this is what I love about chapter 7. Tonight we get to see who's able to stand. It's the ones that God has called to stand. It's the ones that He will mark. Okay? And, and again, that's why chapter 7 is one of my favorite chapters because of that, but for some other reasons too that we'll get into tonight. But that's what we're going to see. We're going to see who is able to stand. And ultimately, you know, I kind of titled this message tonight, Choose Your Mark. You know, <laughs> choose your mark, because ultimately each one of us have to choose which mark we're going to bear. The mark of God or the mark of Satan. You know, there's no in-between. There's no, you know, spiritual Switzerland. There's no, you know, neutral ground. I don't know, you remember when you used to play, you know, I don't know, hide-and-go-seek or whatever. There was always this neutral ground, you know, you could go to or whatever when you are a kid. Maybe I'm, I don't know, outdating myself here. But, but, you know, but here's the thing. There's no neutral ground. There's no neutral ground. You're one or the other. If you're not for Christ, you're against Him. There's no other choice. And so if you don't bear the mark of God, then you bear the mark of Satan. And I know that sounds rough and that sounds tough, but that is the truth. But that's what's going to happen. And now in the tribulation, people are definitely going to have to choose. 
they're definitely going to have to choose, and it's going to it's going to cause them, most of them, to lose their lives when they choose Jesus Christ. You know, we still live in a nation where that's that's not happening right now, not yet, anyway. <laughs> but in the tribulation, they will have to choose. Now, one of the things I want to touch on before we jump into this is there's one of these things that. You know, as a Christian, as I studied the Word over the years, I guess it was more hopeful, wishful thinking. I always hoped and wished that there'd be some great end-time revival, you know? And many of us would talk about that and say, man, I just, I hope there's some great end-time revival where the Gospel's preached and just millions and millions of people come to Christ. And the more you study the Scripture, the more you realize, the more you realize that's really not in the Bible, and again, I, I, this is a good chapter, I promise. Just, just, just hear me out. But it doesn't really state that in the Scripture. In fact, it says it's going to get worse. And it says that, you know, will Christ find faith on the earth? You know, it asks that question. Not only that, but we know this thing called the great apostasy. I know there's various teachings about that, but I'm still fully convinced the great apostasy is a great falling away. And we're seeing that right now. The early church taught it. The apostolic fathers taught it. All through church history they taught it. The scriptures teach it. There's a great falling away from the true faith of God. There's a false Christianity being preached out there. You know, and, and it breaks my heart because it's not time to mess around. You know, I don't see this great worldwide revival. What I do see in scripture, though, is a revival of sorts. So here's some hope. What I see in scripture is a revival of the church itself. A bride making herself ready purifying herself. You know, God will put you through things if you're a true believer to purify your life. You know, I, you don't have to raise your hand, but I mean, who in here? I, I'll raise mine. Who's gone through some pretty brutal stuff that's helped you just focus on the Lord. That's helped you get a bunch of junk out of your life and just focus on Him and know what's important. I do see in Scripture a bride getting herself ready. A purification. And that is a revival of sorts, isn't it? Because imagine, I've, I've often said, I love that poem that Pastor Chuck say, give me ten men who are Christ-centered men, who will stand for the Christ they adore. Give me just ten who are Christ-centered men, and I'll soon give you ten thousand more. It is amazing to me what happens when a group of people are sold out for Jesus Christ. When people will light themselves on fire for the King and let the world watch Him burn. It's amazing to me when a church is purified, when a church, when a Christian is so into the Word of God and into His truth and into the Spirit and into everything about the Lord that you can just see them burning bright for the King. You know, and don't you want that for yourself? I know you do, and I want it for myself. And I think it's one of those things we should strive for, and I think in the end times that I believe we're now living in, the Bible does tell us that the church is going to make herself ready, like a bride preparing herself. You know, and us guys, maybe it's hard for that kind of language, you know, <laughs> you know, to think of yourself as the bride of Christ. But, you know, I remember when I'd play sports, you know, and some of you guys who played sports, you know how you prepared for a game. Some of us that, you know, maybe you're into something else. How did you prepare for whatever it was your hobby or whatever you loved, whatever you had a passion for? How'd you prepare? You know, I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I took it serious. And I want to do the same for my king, but even in a greater way. And so I do see, I see a church getting herself ready. But I don't see this worldwide revival that many people preach, that many people teach, until the tribulation. And we're going to look at that tonight. This is what the hope is found. There is a revival that happens during the tribulation where we will see tonight that the people who come in to the kingdom cannot be numbered. Now that's a revival. That's a revival that can't be numbered. It cannot be numbered. And the other thing, we know that the tribulation, it's dealing with God is pouring out His wrath on a world that rejected His Son. We know He's dealing with Israel corporately. But we also know God in His mercy is pouring out His wrath. Do you understand that? He is making it so bad, incrementally, that any that would be saved will be saved. And I just want you to think about this. Think about some of our friends and family that, you know, or maybe in some of these Laodicean churches, you know, that believe some of these false doctrines, some of these crazy things. Think about what will happen when the trumpet sounds. Think about the day after the trumpet sounds. Think about the Sunday after the trumpet sounds. 
there's going to be a lot of full churches that Sunday after the trumpet sounds. You know, hopefully none of us here, right? Hopefully. But there's going to be a lot of full churches the day or the week after the trumpet sounds. Because many are going to realize they didn't have true faith. They were those who didn't have true faith. And you know, that should motivate us, not only to make sure we are in the faith, right? I always challenge us, but to share our faith with those around us. Because the more I see, I mean, I've seen some heartbreaking things this last week. You know, statistics on this younger generation, where now Barna released this survey where 30% of millennials and Generation Z now claim they identify with the LGBTQ community. 30%. Two years ago, it was 9%. There's a spiritual darkening on our nation and on this world. And what the darkness needs is the light, the light we have, the light we carry. You know, and some of the other things that break my heart is that there's a lot of false doctrine being taught in these experiential churches. You know, that want to draw you in, they want to draw the world in with world events, you know, with entertainment and all this fancy worship and their smog and fog machines and all this stuff. And yet their message is anything but scripture. And this is what I know about the tribulation. This is what I love. Again, it's God's wrath, but it's His mercy. I don't think you're going to be able to sell very many books that say your best life now during the tribulation. You know? I don't think you're going to be able to, to teach people name it and claim it when you have the black horse riding in and everybody, you know, oh, what are you going to name and claim your ingredients for a loaf of bread? You know? What are, what are they going to do? I think, you know, if you think about kingdom now theology, there's a whole doctrine now that's kind of replaced the name it and claim it doctrine because that's been, you know, shown to be false. Now there's kingdom now where they believe there's a whole group of people who call themselves Christians who believe they're going to take over the seven pillars of the world, the seven mountains, government, entertainment, new, all this stuff, and that they're going to usher in the kingdom of God. Well, during the tribulation, they're not going to believe that anymore. They're not going to believe it's their best life now. They're not going to believe in name and claim it. It's as if God is going to rip all of that garbage away from them. And all of these people who worship at the altar of experiential Christianity are going to be left alone with the Word of God. And I think many of them in that moment are going to see the truth. And my heart breaks for these folks. And, and I'm, I, we haven't even started the Scripture tonight, but this is the thing. You know, I was praying about this and I remembered... I, don't, I get some vivid dreams every once in a while, and I know they're from the Lord. And a few years ago, I had this dream, and I want to share it with you. And this is not Bible. This is through the filter of Marty. Remember, I'm held to a higher standard of judgment, so I'm careful. But I had this dream, and in this dream, one of my friends who I love, I love this person. They're a great friend, but they're, ex they're into experiential Christianity, into some of this, you know, kingdom now, name it and claim it stuff. And um, I had this dream. And in this dream, I was standing there. And it was just this humble place, this little valley. And I could see this great theater and all these people in suits and dresses. And they were so dressed up and they were just so beautiful. And they're heading into this theater, this beautiful theater. It was all shiny. And my friend is standing there with me and he's telling, come on, this is it. This is the answer. And I was about to go and something just spoke in my spirit. said, no, stop. And I looked and then I looked over my shoulder and I looked at this humble little path, this footpath, where there were these humble people walking and there were these branches with leaves and it was a little archway. And they were walking on this little narrow, humble path, not dressed fancy. And God spoke to me and I woke up and I, I honestly just started praying because I knew what it meant. There are going to be so many people who were duped. So many people, but this is why I love chapter 7. All those people we love, all those people we preach to, family members, I have family members, and I'm sure you do too. All of those people that we have, that we try to teach the gospel, we try to preach the gospel, that reject it, many of them, if the Lord comes soon, many of them will receive Christ in the tribulation. So at least there's that hope. And I really believe that. So, with all that being said... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for the intro, but let's dive into chapter 7. Because again, this is, this is a beautiful hope, chapter 7. It's, there's some rough stuff in it, but there's a beautiful hope here. And the thing about chapter 7 is I want you to understand, again, it's a parenthetical chapter, it's a pause, and these events of chapter 7, they're not necessarily happening after chapter 6. They are for us, right, as we read. But this is most likely happening before the 5th and 6th seal, and you'll see why. Revelation chapter 7, verse 1. 
After these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth or the sea or in, on any tree. Okay, a quick note, because Pastor Chuck used to talk about this. People who want to find something wrong with the Bible, they'll always find something wrong with the Bible, and they'll tell you about it. You know, oh, it can't be true, because look, it says the four corners of the earth. What, you know, these people writing the Bible, they thought the earth was flat. And I always say, well, you've never heard that expression, the four corners of the earth? We still use it today, right? It's just a saying. But if you look at the language, gonia, that's the word. It means a quadrant or a fourth. All it's saying is here is when it says the four corners, it's saying the four quadrants of the earth, literally in the Greek. So it's not, God didn't know his earth wasn't flat. Here's the thing. This is just talking about four quadrants. But notice what it says. It says it's gonna, they're gonna, God is going to have them hold the four winds of the earth back, that they wouldn't blow on the earth. Some people say this is just spiritual. I think it is spiritual, but I think it's natural, too. I think these are the, the winds of judgment, as we'll see. But I think also, I think it's physical, too. I think it will stop the winds of the earth. Now, remember this. In Revelation chapter 11, we're going to talk about the two witnesses. They're going to they're stop the rain from falling. And how do rains work on the earth? They work with the wind cycle. The rain cycle and the wind cycle work together. You can't have rain without the wind. Now, I think people in probably eastern Idaho are like, hey, great, no wind, right? Have you ever been over there? Everybody walks like this, you know, because the wind, it just howls. But the truth is we need wind, and it's going to cease, and that's going to be really eerie. But look at verse 2 and 3. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. This is why I believe it's most likely, this event, these events are most likely before the fifth and sixth seal judgments. Because remember what happened in the sixth seal judgment. The whole earth is impacted. Every mountain moved from its place. Every island moved from its place. Here it's saying, don't harm the earth or the sea or the trees. I think a few trees would be harmed if every mountain was moved from its place. So this is why. And again, I'm not dogmatic. I'm just telling you why and what I see in the scripture. But there's a purpose for the winds to stop here. There's always a purpose for what God does. And it's for this sign. This sign. Um, the servants of God have to be sealed. And I love this, on their foreheads. And we know the enemy, he's an imposter, right? He's an imitator. He always does things that are similar, right? We know that from the white horse in chapter 6, the Antichrist, who's going to try to look like Christ, but he's an imposter. But if you would, turn over to Revelation 14, because I want to show you, um, we, all, we all know about the mark of the beast. But I, just, I think it's important to cover this, because, again, the people of the tribulation have to choose which mark they're going to bear, but so do we. And I think it's always important to remind us of what's coming. Revelation 14, verse 9 says this, Then the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image, and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. And they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whoever receive, receives the mark of his name. So again, they're going to have to choose which mark they bear. You can turn back to chapter 7. We'll do a little bit of turning tonight. Not, not a lot, but a little bit. But where it says, do not harm the sea or the trees till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. I want you to understand something. That, that word right there for sealed, in the Greek it means a stamp or a signet, or I love this other definition, a private mark. God's private mark. And we know all the signs and symbols are explained elsewhere in Scripture. We know that. There is precedence for this, for God marking His people on their foreheads. We're turning again. Go to Ezekiel chapter 9, because there's this incredible story in Ezekiel chapter 9. We were talking before the service. Um, somebody was studying Ezekiel and how, how brutal that, that book is. And yeah, because God brings His judgment against His people. And here in Ezekiel chapter 9, I'm going to read verses 4 through 6. What we have going on here, 
Before that are these six, he calls them men, but they're angels. Okay? And they come through this thing called the upper gate. And one of them has, an, has this thing called an inkhorn. And God tells them to go and mark all of the men and women, all the people, the men, it, it lists, but it's all the people of Jerusalem that belong to God. Ezekiel 9, verse 4 through 6 says, And the Lord said to him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and cry over all the abominations that are done within it. I gotta stop there. <laughs> Don't you ever find yourself just sighing and crying over everything that's going on in the world today? I have to tell you, I watched something today, I won't even go into it. I watched something today, and the injustice of it all, I'm a justice guy anyway, but when I see injustice, true injustice, it breaks my heart. And I was watching this, and my heart was just breaking for the people going through this because of the injustice. This world stinks. <laughs> and this world system stinks. But one day, real justice is coming. You know, not fake justice, not this social justice that's not real justice, but real justice is coming. And one day, God's going to make it all right. But until then, we should be those whose hearts break for the garbage that's going on in this world, for these young people, for people in general, who are just caught up in lies and the wickedness of the enemy. We ought to be those who cry over the abominations that are done within it. We ought to be. And if we're not, there's something wrong. There's something wrong. But look at verse 5. To the others he said in my hearing, go after him through the city and kill. Do not let your eyes spare nor have pity. Utterly slay old and young men, maidens and little children and women. But do not, do not come near anyone on whom is the mark. And begin at my sanctuary. Whew. Where's judgment begin? Right there at his sanctuary. His temple. You know, we're the temple now. You and I. The temple of the Holy Spirit. What is 1 Peter? This is still his pattern. 1 Peter 4, 17 tells you and me, For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Again, bride, God is getting us ready. The Lord's getting us ready. He's coming for His bride. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you letting Him purify you? Is your heart breaking for the atrocities in this world? Are you praying? Are you seeking Him like never before? We ought to be. But here in Ezekiel chapter 9, God, I love this, He marks those that are His. He marks all of those that are His. Now, I want you to understand something. This is so, I just love this stuff. You know, I've talked to you a little bit about the Hebrew language. And remember I told you that each one of the letters in the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, each one of those letters, they, yeah, they make words, they formulate the pronunciation of a word, but each one of those letters have a picture meaning. Remember I told you the name of God, the generic name of God, El, is an Aleph and a Lamed. The Aleph is an ox head. It's the first letter of the alphabet in Hebrew. It's an ox head and represents power or strength. The Lamed is a shepherd's crook, and it represents a shepherd or a leader. That's the picture. And so when you look at the name El, Aleph and Lamed, it means strong shepherd or powerful leader. That's what the name of God means, the picture meaning. Here's what's great. This word mark in Ezekiel, it's the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet, Tav, Tav. Its picture meaning is a sign or a monument. Now I just want you to grasp this. Again, I love this stuff. It's a Tav, and it means a sign or a monument, and it was given to the Hebrew people. And this is 500 years before Jesus Christ. And yet, you know what the Tav is? The ancient Tav. They've changed it now. But you know what it is? It's the perfect shape of a cross. God had this angel go through Jerusalem, the streets of Jerusalem, 500 years before Jesus Christ, before Yeshua HaMashiach, and put a tav on the foreheads, a cross on the foreheads of the men that were His, of the people that were His. The cross. <laughs> and that's still the same for us. Are you marked with the cross? The cross of Calvary? The cross of Golgotha? It's still the same for us. You know, and I, I look at God's Word like that, and I just see, how can people not believe the Scripture? You know? 
But not only that, one of the things that's remarkable is that we're not just marked by the cross, because the cross of Calvary is where it all happened. But in 2 Corinthians 1, verse 21 and 22, it says, Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us in God, who has also sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. He gave you and I, as believers, the Holy Spirit, His Holy Spirit, within our hearts as earnest money, a down payment for more to come. You and I, as believers, are sealed. The cross of Calvary sealed us, the Tav. But we are sealed even more so by His Holy Spirit. I think that's a remarkable thing. But look at what's coming for those who do not have the mark of God in Ezekiel chapter 9. I'm going to read the last part of verse 6 and then verse 7. This is what came to those who didn't have the mark of God. And it's similar to the Passover when you think about it. So they began with the elders. They began with the elders, the leaders, the pastors. They began with the elders who were before the temple. Then he said to them, Defile the temple and fill your courts with the slain. Go out. And they went out and they killed in the city. And right now you're thinking, I thought you said this was an uplifting chapter. <laughs> it is. It is. It is. Because here's the thing. You know, God's grace and His wrath, there's an invisible line. We learned that in Romans 1. There's an invisible line between where God's grace ends and His wrath begins. But during the tribulation, it's going to be clear. He is going to pour out His wrath on a world that has rejected Him, on a world that said, we don't want you. But His mercy, He's going to let any that would be saved will be saved. Now turn back to Revelation 7 so we can get into some of this hope. I'm going to start, I'm going to read verse 3 and 4. Um, because we're going to see, again, this answer to the question of who is able to stand. Revelation 7, verse 3 and 4. Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. Oh, I love this. I love it. I love it. This is who is able to stand. Those that God marks... Those that God seals. And be confident in that. If you're marked by God, if you're sealed by God, you're His. But that's who's able to stand. Even in the days we live, this is who's able to stand. Is those of us who are sealed by God. And you know, um, another heartbreaking thing is you have whole cults out there and churches who teach they're the 144,000. You know, um, I've, I've over the years gotten to know several Je Jehovah's Witnesses and I love them. They're sweet people, the ones I know. But they believe they're the 144,000. They believe that there's a special group of them that are the 144,000. And they're not alone in this. There are several teachings from several different groups. I mean, Herbert Armstrong, his group years ago, they believe they were the 144,000. But the, the thing that always breaks my heart is they're just not reading Scripture. <laughs> they read it, and this is a danger for us. They read it, and they only see what they want to see. You know, it's kind of like, you know, when I... Listen to my wife. You know how many times? I only hear what I want to hear. You know what I mean? I think something like that. Anyway. But they only see what they want to see. And if they would just test the scripture. I remember years ago I was talking to a couple. A man and a, a wife that were um, part of the Jehovah's Witness. And they, they kind of, you know, they didn't really like my response. And I was talking about the 144,000. And I, I looked at him and I said, oh, really? Is that true? And I looked at his wife and I said, so are you a virgin? He's like, hey, hey, wait. So maybe I shouldn't have done that in hindsight, right? But the thing is, is if you know about the 144,000, there's very specific requirements for these men. First of all, they have to be men, Jewish men. Second of all, they have to be virgins. There's no deceit in their mouth and they're without fault. Let me read. I won't make you turn, but I'll read this from Revelation 14. This is the requirements. This tells us, and this is another thing. We read in Revelation 14, they're standing with the Lord at the end of it, all of these horrible things. We know they're able to stand, and He doesn't lose a single one. But let me read you Revelation 14, and you tell me if these requirements line up with just anybody being the 144,000. They sang, as it were, a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders... And no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who were, who were redeemed from the earth. These are the ones who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. 
These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These were redeemed from among men, being firstfruits to God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no deceit, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Pretty specific. And so sometimes, though, I'll hear, oh, that, that term virgin's just, you know, it's just symbolic. It's just spiritual. And I'm like, okay, then why does it say they're not defiled by women? <laughs> I mean, I'm just, just asking, okay? I'm just asking. Um, I won't go any further than that. I got plenty of jokes with that one, trust me. So I'll just leave it alone. But, but it remind, there's also some very specific requirements that we're about to read in Revelation 7. And even though this is a little monotonous, I find it such a privilege to read what I'm about to read. And it's, believe it or not, it's hard for me, and I, and I won't go into why, but here's the thing. What an honor to read this list. It's a little monotonous, but just bear with me. I want to read it all. Verse 5 of Revelation 7. This is who was sealed. Of the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Gad, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Asher, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Simeon, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Levi, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Issachar, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Joseph, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000 were sealed. That's pretty specific. That's very specific. It's not symbolism. And again, we know that God is primarily dealing with Israel during the 70th week of Daniel, during the time of Jacob's trouble. That's the name of the tribulation. We know that he's primarily dealing with Israel. And we know that these, these 12 tribes that are named here, you know, sometimes though we hear the argument, all the tribes of Israel are lost. There's no way, you know, you can identify these. And I always say, you think God lost them? <laughs> you really think God doesn't know who's from which tribe? Seriously. Do you believe Genesis 1? If you believe Genesis 1, then this should be easy. Not only that, you know something fascinating? When you do DNA tests, it's really almost impossible to find out Jewish heritage through DNA. It, they can, you know... It can come down to a region or whatever. But here's a remarkable thing that's just happened in the last handful of years. They found a genetic marker in the DNA for one kind of Jewish person. The priests of Israel. From the line of Cohen, if you've ever heard that last name, it means priest. Or how about Levi or Levit? Okay, those last names, if you're a Levi, a Levit, or a Cohen... It means you're most likely part of the priestly class. Not all of them, but here's the other thing. In Israel, if, if you ever get a chance to visit there, you can go to the Temple Institute. They've recreated every implement for the temple. It's ready to go. Not only that, because of this, they've established the priestly line. Their priests are in place. Right now. Yeah. They're in line right now. And because of that genetic marker, God just has a way of winking at us, doesn't he? It's just incredible to me. But in all of these, this list of 12,000 men from these 12 tribes, there's some amazing things. But note that there's one tribe missing. And I've talked about it before. The tribe of Dan is missing. Not only that, but there's another name that's missing, although the tribe is there. And I'll explain. Joseph received a double portion. Okay. Ephraim and Manasseh, his sons, were noted as two tribes. But in this list, we see Manasseh, but we don't see Ephraim. We see Joseph, which means it is the tribe of Ephraim, but it's almost like this backhanded slap. God is sending a message. Ephraim, you're part of this, but I'm not naming you. I'm not honoring you. I'm going to honor your father because of your father. But Ephraim, not you, and not the tribe of Dan. But why? Why? Um, we'll come back to that. The first thing I want to look at is, did you notice also the first name listed is the tribe of Judah? Not the firstborn, Reuben. Remember, the firstborn son is Reuben. But he's not listed first. Judah is. And I think we can all understand why. Our Lord is from the tribe of Judah. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. And you know, I find it fascinating, and we'll look at this. In, in Genesis 49, you don't have to turn there. 
when Jacob, who became Israel, is, is handing out the blessings to his sons, he's given these blessings, blessings to his sons. I love what he says to, to Judah. In Genesis 49, verses 8 through 9, he says, Judah, you are he who your brothers shall praise. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's children shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He bows down, he lies down as a lion, and as a lion, who shall rouse him? In Genesis, the blessing put on the tribe of Judah. And we know our king is the lion of the tribe of Judah, but here's the interesting thing. When it gets to the tribe of Dan, let me read you their blessing, okay? Okay. Dan, in Genesis 49, 17, it says, Dan shall be a serpent by the way, a viper by the path that bites the horse's heels so that its rider shall fall backwards. I have waited for your salvation, O Lord. Well, that's kind of interesting. Thanks a lot, Dad. You know, could you imagine getting that blessing? But here's the, here's the cool thing. Here's another cool thing in the Hebrew language. You know, in verse 18 where it says, I have waited for your salvation, O Lord. That word for salvation, that word in Hebrew is Yeshua. When you see that word, it's Yeshua. So what it says, it says, I have waited for Yeshua, or O Lord. That's literally what it's saying. And it's kind of amazing, because when you think about the tribe of Dan, and this judgment they're receiving by not being part of this group, and we'll come back to that, but, and then they're going to wait on the mercy of Yeshua. It's, it's a prophecy of the tribe of Dan. Now, some say the tribe of Dan isn't included because the Antichrist will come through the tribe of Dan. And this is kind of an old theory. I, I don't really believe it. There are several good pastors, Calvary Chapel pastors and others, that believe this is true. And that's fine. I, I, I get where they're coming from to some degree. But the scripture that they use, I think, is flimsy. I'm just being honest. But here's the thing. People don't think that the Antichrist can be anything but Jewish. But I tell you, you've never been to Israel. If you think that, you've never been to Israel or you've never really spent time talking to them. All they want is peace and they want their temple built. And, you know, I was there through the last administration. I was there visiting. And let me tell you, there were whole signs set up for our president and coins and every. They don't care the nationality of whoever brings them peace and whoever brings them their temple. Whoever does will have their hearts. They're not... They're not that way, for the most part. Maybe some are, but I don't believe that's the, the issue with Dan, okay? Um, in Daniel 9.26, we also know a couple of the reasons I don't believe that the Antichrist will come out of the tribe of Dan is this. Well, first of all, in Micah 5, the Bible calls the Antichrist the Assyrian. That's interesting. But even more compelling is Daniel 9.26, there's a prophecy and it says, And the people of the prince who is to come, that's speaking about the Antichrist, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, the end of it shall be with a flood. That's talking about the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in 70 AD. And we know who did that. The Romans. The Romans did that. Okay, and the prophecy is, the prince who is to come shall be of those people. Now remember, the Roman Empire had two legs. There's another thing in prophecy. It had the east and the west. Assyria was actually part of the Roman Empire, the territory of Assyria. And so I don't believe it's going to be the tribe of Dan where the Antichrist comes out of. I could be wrong, and it, it won't matter. I'll be in heaven. Um, but here's the thing. Here's what I do know about Dan. Now, if you ever get a chance again to go to Israel, northern Israel is so beautiful. I love it. It's so beautiful. And then you get up into the area of Dan, and they have excavated this old, horrible, blasphemous temple that Dan had set up. And you can still see it today. It's still there. You know, it's not in very good shape, but it's still there. And so we know Dan actually led Israel into idolatry. Judges 18.30 says, The Danites set up for themselves idols, and Jonathan, son of Gershom, the son of Moses, and his sons were priests for the tribe of Dan until the day of the captivity of the land. Dan led Israel into idolatry. And there was one other tribe that did the same in the south. Any guesses? Oh, hey, look at that. Ephraim. They, listen to this verse in Hosea 13.1, when Ephraim spoke, there was trembling and terror. He exalted himself above the, above the other tribes in Israel, but through the worship of Baal, he became guilty and died spiritually and then came to ruin, sealing Israel's doom as a nation. Hmm. 
I think those are pretty good reasons not to include them, not to honor them in that list. But I think this is why they're left out. Um, but remember, remember I, I shared with this, or this with you before too, in Ezekiel chapter 48, this amazing thing, this is such a picture of God's grace and mercy. In Ezekiel 48, when Jesus establishes his kingdom on earth and the millennial reign begins, he's going to give Israel, he's going to give each of the tribes their land. Not only that, but if you go look at the map, it's much bigger than you could ever imagine. It's not the little piece of land, it's the one God promised them. It goes into Arabia, it goes into Iran. You go look at it, it's amazing. But here's the thing, the first tribe on the list when he gives the land out to Israel is the tribe of Dan. And Ephraim's on there too. They're like fourth on the list. But Dan, what a picture of God's grace and mercy. You know, what a picture of his mercy. I love that about God. You know, God is the God of second chances, third chances, a hundred chances, isn't he? But this is the thing that always breaks my heart about this passage. It, it didn't have to be this way. You know, in our own lives, we mess up. We've had, you know, times where, you know, we could have just went forward and did what God called us to do, but we didn't. And we missed out. And Dan missed out. And Ephraim missed out. And many times in our lives, when we don't do what God calls us to do, we miss out. And God can't wink at sin. God can't. We are to be holy because He is holy. We are to be a bride who makes herself ready. We have to be. Because here's the thing. You know, many times I've heard the verse, you know, in Matthew 6, 33, I've heard it quoted this way. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. And I always go, wait a second. And I've heard that several times. And I said, that's not what the verse says. The verse says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. We need to be those who seek righteousness, especially in the days we live. You want to burn bright for Christ, you need to seek righteousness and holiness, and not as legalism, but out of love. He marked you. He sealed you and me. We're saved. From all this we're reading, we're saved. Every single one of us. Every single one of us. But I love it that Dan and Ephraim will be restored. God didn't forget them. He gives them another chance. And it starts with his, his amazing outreach team. You know, we always try to create outreach teams. How would you like to have 144,000 on your outreach team? You know, and most likely, again, these 144,000, I believe they're going to be uh, called out. They're going to be raised up by the two witnesses that we'll see in another parenthetical chapter in chapter 11, the two witnesses. I'll just throw my hand out there. I believe they're Moses and Elijah, and here's why. We'll cover it when we get there. You can, you can argue that, and it's okay. Some people believe it's Enoch, but I'm going to tell you why I believe it's Moses and Elijah. Number one, every one of the, the plagues, every one of the signs that they're able to perform, the two witnesses in chapter 11, are the exact same miracles Moses and Elijah did when they were on the earth. Exactly. Not only that, we know that Elijah never died. And then we see this peculiar verse where they fight over the body of Moses. God wins. And then we see Moses and Elijah standing on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus. Okay? That's a little bit of my argument. We'll, we'll, we'll cover it more when we get there. Again, these aren't things we have to divide over. You're welcome to your own opinion. You know, I have mine, you have yours. But, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm trying to be honest with the Scripture. This is my opinion. But I think they're going to be raised up by the two witnesses. And I think it's going to be an amazing outreach team. 144,000. Look at verse 9 in Revelation 7. Because this is the result of their outreach. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and with palm branches in their hands. Oh, I love it. So this is right after the 144,000 are sealed, and many scholars, most scholars believe, I certainly believe, this is a result of their ministry on earth. It's going to be the greatest outreach, the greatest revival the world's ever seen. So many that you couldn't number them. And not only that, they're holding palm branches. When's the last time we saw palm branches? You know, when in John chapter 12, when they're, when they're crying out, Hosanna, remember? Which means save now. But look at this, verse 10 tells us, And crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. It was saved now. 
Guess what it is now? You have saved. <laughs> it's all done. He did it. God saved them. I, he saved them. I also love what Charles Spurgeon says about this multitude because it, it gets me thinking a little bit here. It says, you know, the Bible says there's neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female, right? All of that. But there seems to be a way that we understand people are from different places. I think that when it's talking about no Jew, nor, no Jew nor Greek, male or female, I think it's talking about a class system. There's no classes. In, we're all the same. But there's some delineation. We understand. They understand this is from these people in heaven are from different tribes and tongues and nations, just like the elders, just like the 24 elders and, and all, us, the church, in chapters 4 and 5. But Charles Spurgeon said this, I suppose as he looked at them, he could tell where they came from. There's individuality in heaven. Every seed will have its own body. There will sit down in heaven not three unknown patriarchs, but Abraham. You will know him. Isaac, you will know him. And Jacob, you will know him. There will be in heaven not a company of persons all struck off alike so that you cannot tell who is who, but they will be out of every nation, kindred, people, and tongue. You know, the Bible tells us we'll be known as we are, or we will know as we are known. You know, we will know. We're not going to be dumber in heaven. I used to, <laughs> I think Pastor Chuck said that. The people asked him, are we going to know each other in heaven? And he said, well, I don't think we're going to be dumber in heaven, you know? And I think, I think that's true. I know it's true. We'll know each other. Um, but John, I wanted to point out some things because he could tell not only that these people were from different races, but notice what else he sees. These were different than the elders and those who represented the elders. Remember I told you, the church in chapters 4 and 5, they had, they represented, they had uh, thrones, they had crowns, they had the robes, but they will rule and reign with Christ. But these out of the tribulation, they have robes but no crowns, there's no thrones, and look at how they were ser will serve. They won't be ruling and reigning like we will. This is a different group of people. Remember, the church is special. I told you that. The bride of Christ is something very special that I don't think any of us fully understand how blessed we are. We are something different and special. But I also love one, one pastor explained heaven in this way. He said, everybody will be equal there in this sense. There might be somebody who's a gallon of milk and somebody who's a quart of milk. But they're both going to be absolutely full. And when you think about that, that's heaven. We might have different rewards, different tasks, different places we serve. But none of us will lack. There'll be no jealousy in heaven. Nothing like that. And so this group that comes out of the tribulation, they are different than the church. We are special. You're special. And I don't mean that in a derogatory way. Okay? You, you are very special as the bride of Christ. But I love this because look at this. Uh, look at verse 11. We find out more about this group. It says, All the angels stood around the throne, and the elders and the four living creatures and fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, Who are these arrayed in white robes, and where did they come from? And I said to him, I love this, Sir, you know. <laughs> it's like John, he's being asked by one of these elders, one of us, he's saying, hey, who are these? And he's like, I don't know, you tell me. You know, that's basically what's going on here. So he said to me, these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Isn't that beautiful, beautiful language? They made their robes white by the blood of the Lamb. Though your sins be as scarlet, I'll make them white as snow. I love that. Beautiful language. But this would, group would also include all those martyrs, and that's why I believe this is probably the calling of the 144,000 is before seal 5, when we talked about the martyrs, and seal 6. This would have included the martyrs, but it would have also included all of those people who come to the Lord during the tribulation who realize, ooh, I missed it. <laughs> probably some of our friends and family that we witness to. I pray it's none of us, Okay. But I mean, think about all the people you witness to. You, you sow that seed, and even if it doesn't happen until after the tribulation, pray to God they still make it. But I think that's what's going on here. And look at verse 15, because look at the reward. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple. That's no consolation prize right there. Okay? Could you imagine? I mean, heaven is a place, but it's really more a person than anything. It's Yeshua. It's Jesus. So... They get to serve him day and night in his temple. And it says, And he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. They shall neither hunger anymore nor thirst anymore. The sun shall not strike them, 
nor any heat, for the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living foundations of water. And I love this. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Ah. Again, this is a different group than the church. But they're in heaven nonetheless, and that's what they get to do. That's what their reward is. It's Him. It's our reward, too. We get to rule and reign with Him. It's pretty amazing. But I love that. I find that last line perfect because of what they just came out of. Walvard, in his commentary, writes this, This passage does not have the idea that in heaven we will weep over our wasted life or unconfessed sin, but God will wipe away those tears. He says, The idea may be powerful and guilt-inducing motivator, but it has nothing to do with the meaning of this verse. The point is that the grief and tears of the past, speaking of the trials in the tribulation, will be over when they get to heaven. God will wipe away every tear from their eye resulting from the suffering on earth. And I think that's important because, remember, when we talk about the tribulation, it's not like the movies, it's not like the books we've read. It's hell on earth, literally. You know, when we jump into chapter 8, we're going to start to see some pretty horrible things, even worse than chapter 6. We're going to see hail that comes down from heaven mixed with fire and blood. We're going to see something hit the earth so massive that, you know, a one-third of the living creatures in the sea die from it. And then we're going to see this thing called wormwood, where a third of the water is going to get bitter and more people are going to die. More and more are going to die. But here's the thing. God's going to accomplish His plan through it all. The tribulation's no joke, and I don't want anybody I know, I don't want my worst enemy to go through it. And I love this chapter, though, chapter 7, because it does give hope. Even in the midst of the darkness, God is going to have His plan moving forward. And millions of people are going to come to Him in that day. In fact, I can't even say millions because the Scripture tells us we can't even count it. And that, to me, that's the hope. And so tonight, again, I just ask the question, whose mark do you bear? Whose light do you carry? There are only two choices. You know, in America, we like a lot of choices. But there are only two. Whose mark do you bear? Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the blessing of your word, Lord. Thank you for what it does in our own lives and our own hearts. And God, help us to be stirred. God, move in us in a mighty way and help us to be like this mighty outreach team. Help us to be those, Lord, in this time that preach your word, preach your gospel who get our eyes off of all the, the junk of this world and just focus on you. Help us, Lord, to, to be those who, who weep for others, who pray for others, who seek to share the truth with others, Lord, in a way that's, that's true and palatable. God, just please help us to be those you've called us to be. Empower us through the power of your Holy Spirit. Baptize us fresh and help us to serve you, King. We love you and we honor you. In Jesus' mighty name. Maranatha, and amen.